Boo always had much more trouble going down the stairs than going up. Going up the stairs is merely a matter of applying strength to her legs and just take it one step at a time. Strength is no longer a problem, well fed as she is now. But going downstairs takes much more than strength to do safely. It takes balance and confidence. It is the slippery smooth stone that the stairs are made of, together with the lack of traction on her old worn paw pads that makes her weary of going downstairs by herself. Still, ever since she had been found, she had been learning to trust Papa as he grips her chest harness and makes sure that, even if she slips, she never falls. Truth be told, even if it speaks no words, it wasn't Papa who found her. She had been found by Mama on the internet. She looked at the picture of this light brown, almost white, hazy-eyed, droopy-eared, robust but skinny and clearly very old sort of Portuguese pointer and called me to see it. From looking at this picture to welcoming her in our house were just a few weeks and it wasn't earlier due to the rules in place on the shelter she was in. They wanted to make sure we really meant to take care of her, which is quite understandable. After carefully and supportedly negotiating the steps down, as well as the very few and much easier steps upward after those in the hall, I open the door and she crosses the threshold outside. She doesn't see very well anymore, so the outside must be always a source of brightness that is well above the usual when compared. Even if it's night time, the street lamps shed a far brighter luminosity for sure. Then, of course, there's the fresher air that she feels immediately. She picks up the first scent to follow when we step outside. Sniffing her kin's urine is an interest now, perfectly normal to any dog, of course, but it hadn't always been that way. She used to be completely uninterested in the scents, in the street, in walking, when she first came to her new home. Her actual age is unknown. So she was welcomed into this strange place, our home, having spent many a year, at least six years that we know of, in a dog shelter that has dedicated people and lots of goodwill, but also lacks much of what is needed to provide dignity. They really do try their best, with no electricity and with the empty space where once stood a water container that used to be filled by the municipality's fire department as a reminder of the factual nature of this realm's darker tendencies within a framework of a scarcity game. It had been stolen, the water container and one can only imagine that it must have been done so during the cover of night and with a large enough vehicle to transport it. And with it went the only source of water, which, until a new one was placed in its stead, had to be brought in smaller containers by any of the volunteers. So this is where Boo had dwelt. Her seniority had earned her the right to her own cubicle alone, whose walls were all around made of crude bricks, only with metal grating acting as the fourth wall where the gate to it was placed. She felt better alone, without the need to compete with other dogs. Occasionally fights erupt, another sign of nature. And with the ability to rest any time she wanted. A small plastic one-piece sort of house was by the back wall where towels made up her bed. In a corner, a bucket of water. Next to it, the food bowl, which she apparently devoured every time it was served with whatever. Despite the remarkable goodwill of the volunteers facing such inadequacies and an overcrowded shelter, she certainly felt, in addition to, of course, abandonment, this world's natural discomforts of cold and hunger. 
The latter she seemed to try to disguise by drinking water compulsively and obsessively. She had quit barking or making any sound years before we found her. She must have barked all that she had in her to bark during the first years, calling for her family to return until her voice and her broken heart most probably dried up. We saw her and approached her and she made no effort to please us, as is usual with dogs who want to be adopted. She was, at deepest heart, resigned, and her foggy eyes from where she must have seen only our cataract diffuse forms merely stared, making no attempt to call for attention nor harboring any hope, for she had left, left it all in her first few years there. She had accepted that as the best possible fate of all the fates that could have come to her. She had accepted death, not bodily death as it happens to all creatures here, but a much deeper and yet subtler death. And through that death and its acceptance, she was found. We caressed her, hugged her even, but to her this would be certainly merely another temporary interval from her three big brick walls and the grating, with small walkabouts twice a day, that she had at the shelter. However, now she had been found. After following the first few scents she picks up as soon as she finds herself outside, and, if it is the case, relieving herself, her first thought is immediately directed towards the comforts of her present home. Still, she must walk. Not only good for her joints, but also for the swelling on one of her front shoulders. It is our supposition that, adding to abandonment, cold and hunger, violence must have at some point been also inflicted, whether by accident or malice. So I convince her every time to come walk with me. She turns back home and I let her do so. And as she turns back, she feels the leash has not loosened, nor have I started my way back towards the door. So she concludes a full loop and accepts to walk further. Nowadays, she merely applies this kind of passive resistance for a short while, after which she finally accepts that walking is fun and enters her own zen mode, as I call it, walking together at a slow pace. Yet she used to vehemently refuse to walk further than a few meters away from the door. Most certainly, we figured, due to thinking that if she moved too far from it, that meant she would be taken back again. Her official story was only known partially. She had been left there by a family that moved abroad and that somehow decided she couldn't come with them. Before that, it was unknown. Then, she had had attempts at adoption, but they all had failed with very strange official reasons. Later we found that the most plausible, factual, yet unofficial reason had almost certainly been a quite different one. We discovered that, whether it was due to the spaying, which is another fine example of the levity with which mutilation is carried out in this realm, and the insane reasons that justify accepting such a normal practice, or whether it was due to collateral of her former but now cured water-drinking obsession, the fact is, she was incontinent. Now she only needs diapers when she sleeps, for a few drops uh, still appear when she relaxed and um, goes into dreamland, but before she merely needed to sit, and, to her evident shame, as we often saw her trying to conceal it, she would soon find herself sitting on her own little puddle, which she clearly did not sense coming out or understand its emergence, but that deeply shamed and ex upset her. That was clear, for this must have been the real reason for her previous returns to sender, so to speak, 
and for her to consistently going back again within those three brick walls and the grating as a gate. You're gonna take me back. She would often stare at me as if asking that with fearing eyes. Just a walk for the bones and legs, then you've got the munchies and the beds at home afterwards. She took time to trust, as expected, and taught me patience. She taught me far more than patience, in fact, and even more than sheer love and care. She taught me that when I look upon her sweet glass, marble-like eyes, I am actually looking at an extreme caricature of my ego, maybe of the ego that would have been, had I taken the many wronger turns that presented before me after I had taken a few of the wrong ones already. Yes, my ego may not have suffered as much, and it was surely historically only incontinent when it harbored characters that were unable to hold their own BS and self-delusion, or unable to balance their desires with proper and loving inner discipline. Yet, my ego and its many faces over the years reside there beneath that whitish sort of fur and behind those eyes like sky dome balls and between those ears that dangle when moving. And no less important, I also learned that if those foggy cataract ridden eyes were made clear exclusively by eating good food and having warm comfy beds and nothing else, then most sickness is exclusively related to nutrition and recovery, to food and to rest. It also taught me a lot about medicine, if I didn't know already from my poor family history, but I won't go into that now. So after doing a few slow loops during the first phase of the walk, normally about half the length of the street, she at last accepts that it is indeed actually fun to do the walkies and sniff the street smells as she goes, sometimes stopping for the occasional worship from a fellow admirer that can't help but feel that fur. From then on, she trusts, completely, that I will lead her safely back home. This is like taking the walk of life. And it is no coincidence that I see in her my ego self, even in that. Like her, I was found. So I found her. I lacked trust for years. So did she. So I taught her and learned it myself. I too would go around in loops, sniffing this and that, making excuses not to stray too far from my uncomfortable zone of comfort. But teaching her to let go taught me. I am the one learning to trust the leash, as I am guided by my own truth essence, who, like I found her, found me amidst a nightmare of mud and dirt disguised as cleanliness. I bathed her, I fed her, I warmed and comforted her. I, deal, I did all those loving things to this beautiful old dog I call Boo. And I am myself by it washed, fed, warmed and comforted. And also I learned from her that I too like to go to bed in the presence of my true papa. For a last tuck in and the warm comfort of his presence. <laughs>